Steve, you're muted. Please, guys. Okay. So I want to tell hello, Alan Miller of West Side, Providence, Baltimore, Maryland. Hi, welcome. Las Vegas, Chicago, Santa Fe. Who's from Santa Fe? Okay, hi. Vancouver. Okay, hi. I'm sorry, I can't say hello to everyone. Hi, Mom. Hi, Isn't from West Orange. <laughs> this is very challenging for me. I have dial in, I have zoom in, I choose my apartment. It's really crazy. Okay, welcome. Okay, so with that, good. So welcome everyone to uh, my apartment. Uh, Torah class. So first we want to say thank you to the Carmi family, uh, Dr. Rita Steiner, their mom is sponsoring the class in honor of you two amazing sons, Joseph and Dale Carmi. And we also next week, uh, Stephanie and Alex who got engaged like a few, few hours ago. Uh, uh, sponsoring next week, thank you. Okay, so, hi, okay, hi, hi. Uh, my mom is calling me. Alex, what's going on over here? Mom, why are you calling? <laughs> Alex, Alex, one second. Alex, Alex, yeah. your mom is calling you. Alex, just, just press the red button. I'm not touching. <laughs> I'll, I'll text her. I'll text her. Alex, please call your mom. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. So we have. We have a lot of new people. Uh, so firstly, welcome. So I get to do uh, my shtick. So my name is Steve Eisenberg. Many of you I don't know. So two years ago, uh, by the way, I ask everyone, please close your cell phones. Okay, thank you. Is um, I'm not technically a New York City refugee, I'm told, because I moved here uh, six months before the COVID. Casey is a, you are technically a COVID refugee, okay? But six months before I left Manhattan, and about 15 years ago, myself and a young couple, Jody and Gavin Samuel, we started a group in New York called the JICNY, Jewish International Connection, for Jews from overseas. And from that one Shabbat dinner that we hosted, um, we have, before I left, about 10,000 YJPs uh, from 50 different countries. But I came down here, I wanted to continue. I just want to acknowledge a few people. Number one, Zushi and Ephraim. We're doing amazing, amazing events about Harbor. Side. I just want to thank my friend Alex, who slept me all over, and Stephanie, and my son, Stu Ehrlich, getting all the food and everything else. Thank you. All right. So we begin. So also, I want to dedicate the class for all those who need a healing. I'm not going to ask you for names, but whoever needs a healing, Jewish people, the world should have a healing. Okay. So why are we here tonight? So anyone who's heard me before, you know, they say many things about the Jewish people. We're cheap and we're clannish and we control the banks, we control the media, we do, we do whatever. But one thing the world doesn't say about Jews is that we are a foolish, stupid people. We ask people to give them reasons why they don't like Jews. They have all these reasons, but no one's going to say, I hate Jews because they're stupid. No, not that. So you can't be one of the smartest people, successful people in the world, and also willing to die by this thing called the Torah is that every one of you in this room, and I don't know most of you, I know one thing according to CJF, Council of Jewish Federations, everyone in this room, your grandparents, or great grandparents, certainly your great grandparents, were very connected to this book called the Torah. And according to CJF, if your great grandparents were not connected to the Torah, not only would you not be in a Torah class, you wouldn't be Jewish today. You cannot find, in Israel you can because 80% of the country is Jewish, so by small you'll marry a Jew, but we, all right, so why are we studying Torah? Is because, the Torah gives us tremendous wisdom and insight. And again, I say this every week. If you don't leave the class tonight, especially this week, I just want to acknowledge my friend, Ralph Chickley. Where's Ralph Chickley? All right, so Ralph Chickley, he's a tremendous partner. During the abyss of uh, Corona, when the whole world was waiting for the end of the world, is that Rob and his, uh, uh, his I don't know, Sylvia started Corona, what's it called? Corona? Cuties. 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 Cuties, okay? And when everybody was freaking out, they had 
many, many Shaduchim engagements because of this. I just want to acknowledge Rob, who's been a tremendous uh, support. Okay. We'll be fed Torah because it'll give us tremendous wisdom. This week's portion is all about Shaduchim and marriage and dating. And again, if you don't leave here with new information, it's not the Torah, it's I knew a good job. Okay. So the name of the Parsha is called Chai Sarah. Chai Sarah, the life of Sarah. And Sarah's lifetime was 100 years, 20 years, and seven years in the years of Sarah's life. And Sarah died in Kiryat Arba, which is Chavron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to Yulah of Sarah and bewail her. Abraham rose up from the presence of his dead and spoke to the children of Heth, saying, I'm an alien and a resident among you. Grant me an estate for a very site with you that I may bury my death before me. So what's going on here? Mother, Sarah, our great, 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 great Bubby, and our great, right, great, great, great grandfather was Avram Vino. Chai Sarah, Sarah passes away, right? She's, she passes away. So what's interesting is the appellation of the Torah portion is called Chai Sarah, a life of Sarah. But it's interesting because it's the antithesis of that. It's about the death of Sarah. Right? It's about the death of Sarah, but yet it's called Chai Sarah, Chai meaning life. And later on the Torah, we have a portion called Bayachi, Bayachi, many months from now, and Bayachi, and he lived. Who lived? Yaakov Avinu, the last of our patriarchs. Yaakov Avinu, it's about his death. So, what is the Torah trying to tell us? It says Chai Sarah, the life of Sarah, but it's about her patira, about her death. And later on, Bayachi is about Yaakov's death. Is the Torah teaching us what real life is? What is real life? Real life is the difference that we make in the lives of other people. We are in this apartment right now, 94, 99 Collins, because of the life of Sarah and Abram, who's still alive. Is that we are here tonight because of the difference that Chai Sarah made, our great great grandmother made. The Torah is teaching us that. Hi, welcome. Hi. Hi. Oh, hi. hi. Welcome, welcome. Yes. You're good? You're good? Okay, fine. So again, it's called Chai because the Torah is teaching us at the end of it all is real life is the difference we make. It's not about the money that we have and the cars that we have and how many pairs of Prada shoes. And I bless everyone should have everything in material possession. Okay, so Sora lifetime was 127. So those of you who've been to class before, you know the Torah is very laconic. It's very, very pithy. The Torah never uses extra words. It's very, very cumbersome. And by the way, most of the Torah class I'm giving over was all given to me by Rebbe and Esther Youngrace. So for those of you who said under Rebbe and Youngrace, you hear her, it's really her, her Torah class. Why does the Torah say 120 and seven? It's very cumbersome. It should say that she died at 127. The Torah doesn't use extra language. So our Chazal, our sages teach us at 100, she was like a 20 year old in terms of her beauty. Okay, she was as beautiful at 100, 100 as she was 20. At 20, she was like a seven year old in terms of innocence. And we all know as we get older, most of us, we get very jaded. We get, we get experience with people, especially dating. And after a while, unfortunately, we get hardened. At 20 years of age, she was not hardened by life. She was like a seven year old, 127. So those of you who, know a little bit uh, more, more Jewish background, is we got we have a holiday called Purim, and in the Megillahs, Esther, it says that Esther reigned over how many provinces? How many? 127. There's no accidents in Torah. Why? So we learn from this is that every year that Sarah lived, every year that she lived, she made a difference in the world, and her great, 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 great granddaughter would benefit, okay, physically from her spiritual giving of the uh, our spiritual giving. What have we learned from this? That when we are involved in chesed, when we're involved in kindness and goodness, we think whatever we did is over, but it's not for us. It's our children, our grandchildren our grand are going to benefit materially, spiritually, because of the actions of our grandparents and great-grandparents. And I can tell you, there's so many amazing things that happened in my life, I know has nothing to do with Steve Eisenberg, but because of something my antecedents did hundreds of years ago, or maybe even my, my parents, all right? So very often you'll see someone and the person will be not yet great, not yet great, all right? Maybe even a creep. And you say, why should Hashem, why should Hashem give this person such bracha? Because you don't see all the 
acts of the, of the, of the show is that maybe his great great grandparents did something so extraordinary, and then Hashem decided this person should have a bracha, should have a blessing. So again, several of the 127, it's also teaching us an amazing, amazing lesson that life is full of stages. There's times in our lives which were challenged. There's times which are happy, challenged, et cetera, et cetera. But Sarah's life becoming everything. Okay, so what happens? She dies. She dies in the city of, um, she died in Kariyat Arba. And Kariyat Arba, we all know, is the city of Chavron. So we all know who was buried in Chavron is Abraham, Sarah, Rivka, okay, who else? Yitzchak, Rachel, Imenu, was not buried there. She was buried in Bethlehem. But all of the matriarchs and patriarchs are buried in Chavron. But again, you need to know the Hebrew language. The word Chavron, the derivation is Chibor. What does Chibor mean in Hebrew? It's meant to be connected, to be joined together. All right, in Hebrew, a friend is called a Chaver, Chibor, because you're connected to that person. Might be spiritual, might be business, whatever. Okay, we have, if you study Torah with someone, it's called a Chavuta. A Chavuta, because Chaver, Chibor, you're connected to the Torah, right? So Chavron connected us how? Connected us with the matriarchs and patriarchs. It connected us to heaven and earth. And this is where the matriarchs and patriarchs are buried. Okay, so Sarah dies, and Abraham came to eulogize Sarah and to bewail her. Okay, so this is the first instance in the, in the world is that Abraham to eulogize the moment, a woman, but he eulogized his rebbitzin. This couple we discussed this before. Ty, welcome. That we discussed before that Avram and Sarah were the, were the wealthy, if not the wealthiest people on planet Earth. And what did they do with their lives? They made a difference with Chesed, Chesed, Chesed. Chesed. And we've discussed this many times before. You go to any Jewish wedding, and again, you ask most Jews. Under the chuppah, why you get in the chuppah in the Jewish tradition? Why? Because that represents the first home of Avram and Sarah. It's, we're saying whatever is in our home is open to everyone, whatever we have to share. Abraham and Sarah changed the world, not by what they said, what they believed, by chesed, chesed, chesed. And again, it's not my opinion. No people does more chesed. No people do more acts of goodness than the Jewish people. Okay, philanthropically, and again, people, you know, get upset, Steve, it sounds very, very ethnocentric. Next time you go to NYU Medical, God forbid, NYU Hospital, go to uh, a Mount Sinai Hospital for a good reason, go to any hospital, any university, you'll see Jewish money everywhere. So friends of mine, why aren't you going to say, Steve, I heard you say this, that's because Jews give money, they put their names on the wall. Non-Jews give their money quietly. So quietly, they don't even know they're giving the money, right? <laughs> if you're giving $100 million a year, people are going to know about it. You go to, my, you go to Mount Sinai, it's Jewish money. NYU, Columbia, Lincoln Center, it's Jew no one gives more money. It's not because we're better than non-Jews, not because we're smarter, because we had Avraham and Sarah who taught us chesed, chesed, chesed. In fact, this is very controversial, but the sages teach us that you meet someone who doesn't, can do chesed, do kindness, Question their Jewishness. I used to work for a company called Bear Stearns. We had to give 10, was then one of the most successful firms on Wall Street. You had to give 10% of your income, okay, to Sadaka. You had to give to, if you're a smart political, you gave the UJ. But where does that come from? It comes from Avram and Sarah. Giving, giving, you're making a difference. Okay, and by the way, not only Jews give to Jews, to non Jews. We all know the American Negro College Fund, 50% is Jewish money, all right, et cetera, et cetera. So now, it says he eulogized Sarah and bewailed her. Why does it say he first gave a hesped? He gave a eulogy and then he cried about it. Should say he cried first and a hesped. Now we know that Avram and Sarah were very, very important people in the generation. You were heads of state. So Lahav, you know, many years ago, when Shimon Peres passed away, we had 50, 60 prime ministers and presidents came to Jerusalem for his funeral, right? his Leviah, right? They got down to business. Avram did not want to tirchai, did not want to anguish all the heads of state. So he gave a eulogy first, and then he cried. Why is the Torah telling us that this man's crying about his wife? The Torah never tells us something unless it's something. Because we're Jews, you're allowed to cry. Yes, Hashem gives, Hashem takes away. I remember many years ago, John F. Kennedy Jr. Okay, was in an airplane crash. He and his wife, they were under hundreds of feet of water, right? hundreds of feet of water. I remember the front cover of the New York Times showed his sister, what's his sister's name? Carol. What's that? Caroline. Caroline. 
So Caroline, hi, welcome. Hi, hi. Caroline and her hus Jewish husband, Schlossberg, were taking a bike ride, okay, as they were zooming, uh, after he was buried. That's not the Jewish way. Somebody passes away, yes, Shem gave us, is you cry, right? We're human beings. We're human beings, we're allowed. I remember my father's, my mom's listening to me, but I remember my, when my father passed away, I was 16, this relative was very, very waspy, and he said to me, don't cry, men don't cry. No, we're Jews, we cry, right? So he says he eulogized and he bewailed her. And this is amazing. And every Jewish home, every traditional Jewish home, every Friday night, a husband recites to his wife, the children recite to their mother. What do they say? Eshes Chayel. Eshes Chayel was the original eulogy that Abraham gave for his wife, Sarah. Hundreds of years later, Shlomo Melech incorporated this eulogy. This has been in uh, Proverbs. But at, by the way, we don't have time, but if you went through Chais, if you went through um, Eshel's Chayel, you'll see every sentence relates to Avram's wife, Sarah. So that's the original eulogy he gave for his wife, Sarah, was, uh, was uh, Eshel's Chayel. Next. So Avram rose up from the presence of his dead and spoke to the children of Heth, and he says, I'm an alien and I'm a resident among you. And basically, he wants to buy a place to bury his wife, Sarah. So what does this mean? We know we, know we have this expression, whatever happened to the matriarchs and patriarchs, lessons to every Jew in every generation. What does it mean, I'm an alien, I'm a resident? I have a green card, I don't have a green card. Like today, a friend of mine in the room shared with me, he has his green card, Baruch Hashem, Slava Bob, okay? He has a green card, thank you, I got him a green card. There's a guy on the beach who sells it, okay, whatever. So, <laughs> his name is Erez, he's very good, okay? Anyway. Whatever. Anyway, so what does it mean, Abraham saying, I'm an alien and I'm a resident? Either you have a green card or you don't have a green card. He's teaching every Jew and every generation. At this time, the land of Israel does not belong to the Jewish people yet. It's the land of Canaan. He's teaching a lesson every Jew. I am a resident of the United States. I love this country. This country has done nothing but good. It's the only probably country in the last, I don't know, hundreds of years, has never had a period where we were kicked out. Yes, there were, there were times in the early, in the early days, 70s, and six certain states wouldn't allow Jews to move in, but since 1776, we've never had a time in our history where we were kicked out. Look at European history. Every country, we're kicked out for 10 years, 20 years, England for 500 years, 600 years. Is, this is the attitude of the Torah's teaching us, Avram. We're an alien or a resident. I live here, but my real home is... 8,000 miles away, Eretz Israel. And whenever we forget that, Shem has a way of reminding us, wake up call, right? German Jews were more German than the Germans. They lived there 800 years. The German Jews lived there eight, we're in this country, 50, 70, my great grandparents came here, 1920s, but seriously, we're only here 50, 70, 80 years, right? The German Jews lived 800, what happened? 1930s, Nuremberg law, laws, what do they say? German Jews, you're not as German as we are. And by the way, we'll talk about it in the 1930s, Nuremberg laws, thousands of Jews were jumping off the buildings committing suicide because they couldn't believe they served in the army. They were so nationalistic and the country turned on them, right? And we have, you know, the, we have the politicians now who are reminding the Jewish people that we have dual loyalty. We're Americans, we love our country, we love France, we love Canada, we love Brooklyn, whatever, okay? But <laughs> We are resident and we're an alien. We live here, we make our panasa, whatever these we're here now. But Avram's saying, I'm a resident, I'm an alien. Again, why does the Torah tell us? Because this is not our ultimate land. We live here. Okay, so I'm alien and a resident. And then what does he say? He wants to buy a burial place for his family. And this is Marit Hamachbela, this is Chavron, he buys physical place in Chavron. All right, Chibor, Chavron, connects the matrix and patriarchs with next worlds. Okay, so there's a famous author, authoress, her name is Nora Ephron, she's Jewish, Zach Ephron, where do they get the name from? All right, here, it's from Torah, they're Jewish, Zach is Jewish, girls, his girlfriend, whatever, that's from Torah class, all right, 10. Now Ephron was sitting in the midst of the children of Heth, and Avram says, can I buy your land? And this, we learned something very, very special over here. Uh, Ephraim replied to Abraham, my Lord, heed me, 
land worth 400 silver shekels between me and you, what is the bury your dead? On one hand, Ephrod says, listen, brother, achi, he's achi, but he says, of course, I'm going to sell you the land. What's money? But he has 400 shekels. Who mentioned money? So on one hand, he says, of course, he mentions 400 shekels. And then it says, Avram heeded Ephron. Ephron said, what's the big deal? No problem. So we learn from this is you have to listen to what, not what people say, but what their intent is, correct? Avram saw this guy was interested in money, money, money. He said, Avram, no problem, but he had 400 shekels. But someone speaks, don't listen to the words, but listen to their intent. You have to listen between, this is all Jewish wisdom. Okay, now, what's very interesting is when Avraham says, I want to buy land, what do they say? You are prince among God. This is a non-Jews. What do we learn from this? If a Jew does his job, if a Jewish woman does their job, we will have an effect on the non-Jewish world, even the Jew, right? When a Jew lives, Kiddush Hashem, when they call him a prince of God because they see that he's special. So some of you might see, I always send cake or food down to my doorman, but I want them to see I'm not the money-grubbing Wall Street guy. They always show it on Wall Street, correct? An observant Jew, a Jew is an observed Jew, right? So we also, the movie, I'm dating myself, Annie Hall, many years ago, on Netflix, whatever, is there's a scene, Woody Allen, he's dating Diane Keaton, who's not Jewish at all, with a lobster and the whole thing. And what happened when he goes to the family's house? What does he see? Grandma Hall, seen as a Hasidic Jew, correct? Everyone see the movie? Go see it, Netflix, someone tonight, right? He, he projects that Grandma, Granny Hall, and you remember Diane Keaton says, Granny Hall hates Jews, okay? Because the truth is, no matter how religious, secular we are, the non-Jew all sees us the same. We differentiate a shoddy, tardy, Ashkenazi, five-town Jew. Up. But the truth is, the non-Jewish world see a Jew as a Jew as a Jew. We see Hasidim. We see South American Jews. Right? When they say we're a prince of God, if we do our job, the non-Jewish world recognizes it. Recognizes it. We all know, we discussed this last week, the, the Turfside tragedy, Yes, there were non-Jews who helped for sure. There were Jews who were not religious, but by and large, who really was involved with the whole chesed object was, was the observing community. That made a tremendous roshan, that made a tremendous impact, not only on the mayor of Surfside, at the Battle Harbor in South Florida, but the entire country were watching. And again, last week I discussed it, I'm sorry, but the president of Paraguay, uh, sister-in-law's family were wiped out. And allegedly, um, Robin Lipschitz said this, I said this last week, the, pres the sister-in-law of the president of Paraguay, but Robin Lipschitz said this publicly, after all this, I'm gonna convert. Okay, I don't know if she's in the conversion class, but Robin Lipschitz, Robin Citrin, but we'll see. But why? So Robin Lipschitz said, you're a Catholic, you know, you be a good Catholic, just no. I never knew what a Jew was until this event. The food, the, 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 the chesed was going on. When a Jew acts, a Torah way, we make a Russia, we make it, we make an uh, infant in the world. Avram Levino and Sorrow, okay, they're billionaires. And what happened was he made a impression on the people. This is all amazing lessons. Okay, so chapter 24. This is WBBF, worth being born for. Okay, if you never came to class, again, God forbid. <laughs> now, Avraham was old, he was well on in years, he's an old man. And it says, and Hashem had blessed Avraham with everything. And Hashem said to his servant, the elder of his household, who told all that it was had, I want a shidduch for my son. This is the shidduch portion. You're going to learn so much. For those of you who know Hebrew, it says that he was well on in years. But if you look at the Hebrew, it says, it doesn't say shanim. What does shanim mean? Years. It says, but. Whenever it talks about someone's life, it never says shamin, really, it says bayin. It says yamin. Why? Because a Jew doesn't live by his years, he lives by his days. I shared with you before, I was turning 40, okay, and uh, my father died 41. I was a little bit of a, a funk. People say, see, my God, 40. And then I went to the oil, the little body where he's buried uh, on, my, on my birthday, the Tammuz, and Chabad. They're amazing. They had these videos 
of people meeting the Rebbe, senators, congressmen, rich, poor, and what I'm about to share with you changed my life. And I hope everyone hears this. So the Rebbe is turning 70 years of age, 70. French speaker is Swasandis. And this guy says to the Rebbe, you're turning 70, you can relax, take it easy. And the Rebbe said that a Jew doesn't live by his years, he lives by his days. And what's the source of that? It says, the Bayamim. He said that years are for passports and birth certificates. But how many of us can look at ourselves at 20, 30, 40, I'm not married, I haven't made my first million, I haven't got a green card. Whatever it is, we all look at ourselves, we're failures. But we don't live by our years, we live by our days. That every day, the Rebbe said that we're alive, things can change. We have six days a week. And this is, a, I think, a tremendous, tremendous lesson for us all. Whenever we feel the boogeyman telling us we're not where we're supposed to be, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. Yes, you have to do what you have to do, correct? But it says, yamin. So uh, the last two weeks, I've, I've been feeling very overwhelmed by Hashem, business, but also have a lot of events coming up. And I'm like, whoa. And then my mom was a great uh, a teacher in terms of time management. Every day I make a list of what I want to accomplish today. Flyer, a program, and then at the end of the week, I look back from Shabbat, and hopefully I get 75% done because we go into our days. I don't know about you, but very often we begin the week going, oh my gosh, stop, chill, take it easy, make a list. It says here, but in Yamin, Avon Levinu did not live by his years, he lived by his days. So whatever you feel, the boogeyman telling you, I'm 30, I'm 40, stop. Shoot with Hashem, careful, blink of an eyelash, everything can turn upside down. This is a tremendous lesson. Again, whatever happened to the Patriot Matrix, lesson for the children. And then it says that Avram was blessed with everything. Can anybody be blessed with everything? So it says Bakol. So those of you who know Hebrew, Bakol means everything. So our sages teach us Bakol had two meanings. Number one, Bakol is he actually had a daughter called Bakol. And if you know, Gematria, Jewish numerology, is that every Hebrew letter in the Hebrew alphabet as a numerical equivalent. If you read up the letter Bakol, it adds up to 52. And 52 is the same gematria, the same uh, Hebrew equivalent of, of Ben, which means son. He had everything because he had a son, right? 90, 99 years of his life, 99 years of life, he prayed, he, had, he was a billionaire. But now that he has a son, he has everything except any Jewish parent. And this is the first Jewish match is he didn't have his son married. I mean, we all have Jewish parents, all right? Mom? Oh, God. Okay. Right. <laughs> so now what happens? He takes his servant, Eliezer, and he says to Eliezer, and everyone listen very carefully, because this is amazing. He says to Eliezer, I'm saying this out of the text, uh, he says, please, I want you to go back to my family, which is around the Harayim. So imagine they're now in the land of Israel. He tells him, to go back over here, which is where today's Iraq is, to find the Shidduch for his son, Isaac. So that makes no sense. Think about this. You have some young boys who always joke about it. In New York City, people would go to Chicago and Memphis and Dallas for, for, a sing, for a singles convention, as if not enough singles in New York City to go out with, correct? Right? People go to Chicago. Why would he send Eliezer to go back to Aram Naharayim, to Iraq. There were girls in Canaan for the son to marry. I want everyone to listen carefully. And we know that Avram's family were all idolaters. So what is the difference, right? Why would he tell? Because, this is very deep, even though Avram's family were idolaters and the people of Canaan were idolaters, there was a very big difference, says Jefferson Yangos, is the family were chesed people. They were kind and they were good. Idolatry, someone doesn't believe in God, they're atheists, agnostics, time reform them. We could teach that if you want to learn. We could take, send you to MJE, Echatara, Chabad, Zalman, whatever it is. But if someone doesn't have chesed, if someone doesn't grow up in a family of giving, you can't teach that. You can if you want to learn. If someone is not a kind, and that we only inherit from our parents. So I'll give an example. So I, my dad, Zal, grew up in a very like waspy home, and they weren't so demonstrative. Right? They didn't hug. My father came. Mom, you listen. <laughs> my father, my mom, my mom doesn't care. My brother goes, "You tell this publicly." Okay, whatever. So, my father came to the family. He says, "Hello, Mrs. Kern." That's my mom's maiden name. My mom goes, "Don't shake my mom's hand. You have to hug my mother." Okay, and wasn't religious, right? So, 
Here's what my father wanted to learn, my mom's ways, correct? Avram's telling Eliezer, you have to find a shidduch for Rebecca. I'm sorry, I have to find a shidduch for my son because I want the chesed. I want that spiritual DNA. I don't know if you've ever been to a semiconductor factory in the Silicon Valley, but they make you wear masks, not because of COVID, okay? You have to wear a mask when you go into the factory. Why? Because if you don't wear a mask, and the smallest dust particle falls on the semiconductor chip, it can wreak havoc in the computer. Imagine a small little fleck, right? So too, the matrix and matrix have to be, they have to have amazing, we don't, they have to have amazing characteristics. Avram understands the next generation have to have chesed. And again, Rebbe Sin Younger said, you meet a guy or girl and they are selfish and they grew up in self they can learn if they want to learn. But if someone doesn't know how to give of themselves, right? You want, that's why if you, you, if you know what to look for is good job to them. They're not your husband, they're not your wife. It doesn't mean people can't change, but someone doesn't know. So the Gemara, the Talmud teaches, and by the way, I went to a class, I had them printed on a card, please take it away out. So the Talmud teaches us, you know, very often people say, Steve, not that I'm so smart, how do you know about this person and that person? It's because the Torah gives us wisdom. The Gemara teaches us the kiso bakosa bakasa. The kiso bakosa bakasa. What does that mean? Is that you tell someone by three things. Again, not judgmental. Kiso, kis means pocket. How do they spend their money? Right? A friend, they'll spend $300. On a shirt in, in sacks, no problem. Ask them to give money to that. Steve, you want $300? Like, seriously? Okay, let's well, spend $100 for a bottle of wine, but ask them for $100 for someone who needs Steve Bikiso, how they spend their money. I think uh, Jackie Kennedy or our son said, give me, you give me someone's checkbook and I can tell you the kind of person they are, how they spend the money. Bikiso, watch how people spend their money, right? You see, so it doesn't mean they're bad. You go to a restaurant, you see the guy or the girl's very cheap doesn't give a decent tip. It doesn't mean they're bad, but these are small. I think Eleanor Roosevelt said, great people do great things in small ways. It's the small things that give people away. And if you know what to look for, the Torah tells us, kiso, koso, kos. In Hebrew, means cup. How does a person drink? I'm not talking if someone gets drunk or not, but when they get drunk, what do they say? Okay, when someone gets drunk, unfortunately, very often, there's a happy drunk and there's a sad drunk, but very often when someone gets drunk, unfortunately, you really get to see what's really going on inside of them, All right? See, I was drunk. I know if you put 15 bottles of liquor in me, I'm never gonna break Shabbos. I'm never gonna break Shabbos. I'll never be trimmed. I might do other things. I'm not gonna do that. So coast, how do they drink? But also it's more than that, is when you go to a wedding of a mitzvah class, okay? And does someone put the bottle of soda down? Or do they continue to hold the Bible up to pour for another person? It doesn't mean they're bad, but that extra something tells you that they're a chesed person. You haven't followed. You go into a building. Does the person hold the door open or do they close the door? It doesn't mean they're bad, but that extra something, the kiso, the koso. Okay. And then finally, the third is the kaso, not the, not the artist. The kaso means angry. How quickly do they get angry? What do they get angry for at? And how long do they stay angry? The people get angry very quickly and then they let it go. I don't know if people will really hurt us. Sometimes we need to process. But if someone gets very angry, Rebbe Sin Yango, she's always talk. if you meet a guy or a girl who gets angry very quickly, the job is you. They're not your husband, not your wife. Because they're getting angry at your wait, the waiter or waitress and you're going to be the waiter or waitress in their lives, correct? If someone gets very angry very quickly over stupidity, I have friends, they'll go crazy I remember one time I had a date. Okay, so the waitress <laughs> brought minestrone soup and it wasn't vegetable soup. And she starts going crazy. She's working all day long. She's a struggling actress. She made a mistake. Okay, you send it back. I said myself, good job, it was over, correct? It doesn't mean she's a bad person, but Coast Picasso, do they get angry? So Avram Avino understands the DNA. Again, these are things you get to look at, right? It's not the big things. They have money, they don't have money. Good look, look at the small things, and that will tell you a lot. So Avram says, Don't get a girl from my community because the, the girls are idolaters, but we can fix that. Give me a week. Any person who's, and that's why, I'm, you know, very often in dating life, if the girl, the woman is strong with spirituality and meet those, the guy sounds very chauvinistic, 
but it says basically a call to Lord Isha, everything depends on the woman. If you have a guy that's a creep and the woman's a sadekas, the Torah says basically come back in three years, two years, four years, and the guy will become a tzaddik. But if the girl's up that B word and the guy's a good guy, the guy will become like her. I've seen this a million times. I have friends of mine who are chesed, amazing guys, and they marry these girls from hell in three, four years is because the woman, again, chauvinistic, but that's it. So he says, I want a girl who has chesed. Okay, so now what happened? So now he says, Eliezer, I don't want a girl. Again, why? Because you can't teach a person to be a kind person. Either they are or they're not. If they want to change, very often people grow up in a family, they don't know how to give. I'm not talking about giving money, I'm talking about giving themselves. The people I call up, Steve, absolutely. And I call other people up, uh, not the greatest year for me, but yeah, I could do that. Can I have a ride to Aventura? Well, yeah, I guess my husband could sit on my wife's, my, my son's lap, whatever. It's like, no, the Jewish response is, we'd love to have you in the car. We'd love to have you for Shabbat, correct? This, this is has, It doesn't mean they're bad, but again, People, great people do great things in small ways. So what happens? Avram Avinu says, Eliezer, I don't want a girl here because the girls of this land are selfish and they're kind. My family, you're idolaters, but we could fix that. Okay, so now what happens? Eliezer, his servant, says to God, please let me be successful. And this is a non-Jew. No matter what we do in our lives, business, an apartment, Green card. If you don't have a bracha from a shem, the shem is not with you. It's not going to happen. You could be the. Sm- I have friends of mine who are so smart. Went to Harvard. Went to Baptist schools. They didn't have a bracha, and nothing happened. I have friends of mine who are really not yet smart. Okay, they think they're very smart. Okay, <laughs> but they're not smart. But guess what? They have a bracha. They buy a building in the worst neighborhood, and all of a sudden, New York State comes in. So we're going to build a highway, and they give them like this. Cap- uh, what do you call? Eminent domain. They think they're smart. Do you have a bracha? Eliezer realizes that if he doesn't have a bracha, so he says, God, please let me do my stuff. Let me be successful. And what happens? He davens, he prays, but then he has a plan. Okay? All right? So I could daven and pray. I hope if I'm successful, if I have to post ad nauseum, have people block me, you're posting too much. But the fact is, if one person comes, okay, who wouldn't come, I have to do my job. If people don't come, they don't come. You have to do your hospitalis. You have to do. So what happens is he has a plan. He says, God, make it easy for me. I should be able to identify. So what happens now? And this is the second generation of Jewish people. This is our matriarch. This is Rebecca. This is Rivka. And what happens? All of a sudden, and it was when he had not yet finished speaking. Davin, and all of a sudden, Rebecca, who's going to marry Isaac, comes by. And we Davin, we pray. We should be shocked. That whatever we dive for, it didn't happen. Why? Because Shem can make it happen. So Rabbi Noah Weinberg, okay, used to say to me all the time, did you buy a lottery ticket? And I would say, because eh, you don't you don't believe in Hashem. So what do you mean? Because if you believe in Hashem, you'd be buying a lottery ticket. You don't believe you're going to win. You have to be in it to win it. If you go somewhere, like I have friends of mine, yeah, I went to the Rock Shul, I went to K-Space, I went to your event, I went to Zushi's event, a Prime's event, but I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Give it 50 bucks and take, let it go to his top house by, with a girlfriend, correct? You have to go out. You have to believe it's going to happen until it doesn't happen, correct? Yes, Steve, I have a job interview with J.P. Morgan, but I don't think it's going to stop. You have to believe he dobbins, and then one second later it happens, okay? When you live by this, the guy a fenster, okay, it says all the time, when you dobbin and pray, you have to believe it could happen in two seconds. And if you don't believe that, you're not really being real with dobbin. Shem can make it happen in two seconds, all right? All right. So what happens now? All of a sudden, he sees a girl, and the girl out of nowhere, this is Rebecca. She says, um, drink, my lord. And quickly, she lowered her jug to her hand and gave him drink. We'll discuss this in past weeks. Whenever we see the matriarchs and patriarchs doing a chesed, a kindness mm-hmm. to someone, it always says they're running they're hastening it's from alacrity or even Jesus. They're always running. This is the attitude of Jew has to happen, has to have when we're doing a chesed for another person. You do it alacrity, it's Jesus. You do it quickly. Why? It's important to them, it's important to me. I'm not saying I could always do it, but if someone contacts me, I need a telephone number, I need this, I need this, I do it with alacrity. Firstly, you don't know if you're going to be around in five minutes to get it done, correct? It's if we really understood, I'm speaking to myself, 
when you do a chesed, you do a kindness for another Jew, a human being, is not only you helping them, you're helping yourself. Because the need that can make it need that measure for measure, that Hashem, we have, I don't know about you, but we have so many needs, business, shaduch, whatever it might be. Hashem sees that we're running to help his people. Hashem responds in kind. I can tell you so many times in my life, things came so easy. And sometimes it's not so easy, correct? Is when we show chesed, not only chesed, but the way you do it with alacrity with Jesus news, right? What happened? She, she says here that she hurried and emptied her jug and she kept pulling the water. This is Rebecca, okay? This is, a, this is, she doesn't even know who this man is. This is Mother Rebecca. She hastened, she threw her water. Now look at this remarkable woman. She says, not only am I gonna give you water, but I'm gonna get water for your camels. She's kind to animals, okay? A great human being cannot be, can't be non-kind to animals. By the way, again, being an Atten person, I know many people who love animals, they couldn't give a damn about human beings, all right? Eisenberg story 55B, <laughs> so, sorry. So there's a store on the Upper West Side, you've all seen the movies called Zabar. And back in the day, now, I thought it'd be freezing to death, but cold didn't affect me. My father never went to go, my grandmother, anyway. So it's freezing, it's like 20 below zero. I have a glove, a gloves, a scarf, I have a coat. And I see outside of Zabor, there's a dog on leash and it's squealing in pain. So five women, five guys, whatever they were, outside, and they're just waiting to pounce on the owner of the dog. Okay? So the owner comes out, they go crazy, the dogs. Meanwhile, there's a human being, one of their species, on a cardboard box, and not one person went over about this human being with no socks, no coat. So something really wrong with this, okay? Be kind to animals, but how about the human being? No one cared. Anyway, I said something, and then whatever. Someone said, yeah, you waffle that's pig, whatever, you, you know, whatever. <laughs> the Jewish girl. All right. The fact is, not only was she kind to him, she was kind to animals. If someone's not kind to animals, there's something lacking. We all know that a camel, a dromedary, can drink a lot of water. For her to feed the camels, she was from a very wealthy family. She's no jack. This girl is not a pachuch. This is Rebecca, okay? So it says that she fed the camels and she took care of the person. And then Eliezer looked and going, oh my God, maybe Shem made it very often in our lives when we've been davening and praying for something. And that which we were davening for happens. We wonder, God, is this really what I've been davening for? You go to an event, you meet a girl like, well, it was that easy? So what happens? Look at this. She says to him, do you want to come to my family's house for the night and I'm going to feed your animals? There's no cell phone. Why would Rebecca have the, this is the ancient world, inviting a stranger, which you just met. She doesn't know, by the way, at this time, that this guy is connected to her, her, her cousin's family because she knew her family would be okay having to stay at the house. Chesed. So we see this throughout Jewish life. You go to Shulon Chavez, I have her surfside, wherever, and a, a guy will say, you want to come for Shabbos. Meanwhile, he never communicated with his wife. Shabbat would use the phone. Why would the husband, because he knew his wife would be okay. But the wife would not want a guy not having Shabbat, correct? Thank you very much. Okay, everyone. So he says, Baruch Hashem, we learn lessons from this. It's one thing, if something, hi, welcome. It's one thing if I say Baruch Hashem to 
something that happens to me. Non-Jew Eliezer sees that something happening for someone else. This is an amazing madrega, this is an effort. If something happens good for me, I'll say Baruch Hashem. But when something happens good for someone else, so a few hours ago, I had like a little to do. A friend of mine said she's not coming tonight because I shouldn't have an engagement party because make people depressed by coming to a single, I said, I should have said this. So I said, number one, you have to work on your Havas Yisrael. Okay, number one, you should really realize just like this couple met out of nowhere at a Shabbos table, it could happen to you. But I'm saying, okay, it's not for me to give Musr, but I had a reaction, is to say Baruch Hashem. When someone tells you good news about themselves, the great person will say Baruch Hashem. Thank you, because we're all one thing. And by the way, if you're really smart, just like something good happens for someone else at the right time, the good things will happen for you. Eliezer is not Jewish because he learned this from his household, of his master. He said, Baruch Hashem, thank God. All right? Not only does he find this amazing girl for Isaac, but she has chesed, she has kindness, and this has to be part of the DNA of the Jewish people. Mother Rebecca, okay. Now, what happens? He now goes. He says, by the way, I work for Avram, your family. He's very, very rich. I want to make a shidduch for your daughter and for my master's son, which is Isaac. So very often, in the non-religious non world, you know, people say in the Hasidic world, the very religious world, parents make a decision for their girls, they have no choice. It's a lie, it's not true. A girl, a woman cannot get married if she doesn't approve. And this is the proof. It's Pasuk 58. They call Rebecca, they call Rivka, and said, will you go with this man to go back to Israel to marry Isaac? And what does she say? I will go. From this we learn that a woman cannot get married to a man unless her, she agrees. Okay, Pavlum, why? So very often, though, in the very Hasidic world, your parents will pick out a boy. The reason why the girls say yes, because they trust their parents. So I have a brother Lawrence, a daughter. My niece will not go out with a guy unless my, my brother and sister-in-law will approve. Why? Because she trusts her parents. They have wisdom. Okay? If parents are 20, 30, 15, 20 years older, they have a wisdom in seeing in people, correct? That's not true. You cannot make a girl get married. Now, what happens over here? And then Rebecca goes back to the land of Israel with Eliezer. And look at this. And it says, and Rebecca raised her eyes, saw Isaac. She inclined while upon the camel. What does that mean? She's in the camel. She sees this guy in the field. And our sages teach us his davening mincha, okay, whatever. And what happens? She fell off the camel. She saw this hunk, this very good looking guy. And she goes, oh my God. Okay, you have to be, what they say? If there's, no, if, 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 if there's no chemistry, then it's history. And there won't be any biology, correct? Is people say you have to be, you have to be attracted. What does that mean? But there has to be attraction in a marriage. If you don't have that yin, okay, something off. But it happens, she inclines off the camel. When she falls off the camel, she sees this guy, she says, oh my God, rich and good looking. And then, listen to this. <laughs> and then she took the veil and covered herself. Guys, I'm off the market. No more J-Date, no more J-Swipe. That's it. No more case base. Brought that rock shield, sleeve eyes, Margushi, fry him. She covered her face. Guys, I'm off the market. She, all right? And then look at this. And this is very controversial. And it says that he married Rebecca, Isaac. This is the first shidduch of the Torah. It says Isaac married Rebecca. She became his wife. And then it says he loved her. We know the Torah it's very clear. Why doesn't say he loved her and then he married her? From this we learn, amazing thing, you have to have whatever it is, love. But again, what is the word? How do you say love in Hebrew? Uh, hav. You have to look at the Hebrew language. Listen the course, the word hava, the root word is hav, which means to give. What does it mean that you love someone? Are you willing to give the person? Yeah, he, they loved each other, but real love comes afterwards. You ask if you have a class assignment, ask any couple married a year, three years, five years, 20, 30 years down the road, ask them the love that they have now, is that the love they have? In the religious world, okay, not for everyone, but basically the couple says, I'm attracted, yes. Can I love them? What does that mean? Can I give to them? 
right? How, why do I love all of you? Why do I love every Jew that I meet, every human being? Because I'm prepared to give someone something in my life. And as a result of me giving to someone, I love them. We have this expression called the Havas Israel, loving another Jew. What does that mean? Is Hav, which means to give. And if you have someone you have stuff with, the way that turn around that stuff to positivity is by investing in the person who turns things around, right? So who do you love more, your parents or your children? You love your children more than your parents. You know, your parents stayed up with you all night, cleaning your book, you staying up, but you love your children more. Why? Have you ever heard a couple saying, I don't know if I'm going to have children. I don't know if we're going to love them. Have you ever heard that? Like people say, I don't want to marry him. I don't know if I love him. No, that's not the Torah way. Is a couple knows they don't love their children. Why? Because they know they're going to give them everything they need. Correct? That's Ahava. So when you find someone, by the way, my mom's listening. She grew up religious. She married my father because I knew I could love him. It's very hard for us. We have all the Hollywood movies, but you have to be attracted. You have to be attracted. But can you, do you want to give, give that person? So there's, um, there's a couple in the uh, Bar Harbor Shul. Uh, uh, is, uh, 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 Bruce Gelb, Bruce Gelb, okay? So Bruce Gelb, his uh, wife's Amy Gelb from Coconut Grub, I think. So I've met her parents in the old city in uh, David's Village in Jerusalem. And I saw this amazing couple. And I said, they must be a second marriage because I've never seen a couple married 40 years so much in love. So I said to Miss, uh, Mrs., um, Mrs., uh, oh God, what's that? No, uh, Bruce's wife's parents. I forget the name. I said, is this your first marriage? He goes, yes. I said, how do you have such an amazing marriage after 40 years? Because every day I wake up, what can I do to make my husband's life better? What can I do to give? And my husband does the same thing. It's how do you make the relationship deeper and deeper? So in American life, and I'm single, I'm saying, why aren't you dating? Why aren't you engaged? Because I fell out of love. What you're saying is I wasn't willing to give. Not what you're going to get. So it says here, Rebecca, they got married, and then he loved her. Yes, they loved each other because he gave her, she gave him. It's an amazing, amazing lesson of, of dating. Are you prepared to make this person's life better? Not what you're going to get, what you're going to give. You love your children more than your parents. Why? Because you're willing to give your children everything. And if you're dating someone, you can't say, I want to give everything to the other person. You know, relationship is in 50-50. And we have an amazing dating coach who's going to speak in a minute. Okay, but... The relationship is what can I do to make the person life better? Okay, so what did we learn tonight? We learned tonight. What did we learn tonight? Hi, we learned tonight that life is full of stages. Sarah's life, she had good times, bad times, had no children, famines, all kinds of things. That there's times in our life that everything goes our way, but that's part of the life's journey. We learned tonight to be a Jew means to be on time, Jew to take pleasure in someone else's accomplishment. He sums it up as nice, but you can't. When hear. Eliezer says, um, Bar Hashem, when someone else gets, uh, finds a soulmate, is, by the way, it's not always easy, but be a person who says, you know, I, very often people say to me, Steve Eisenberg, I'm not, a, I'm not religious, I'm not observant, but I'm a good person. I never understand when they say they're a good person. If you ask me, am I a good person? I'll say, I'm working on it. How could someone call themselves a good person. Guess what? Where we come from, the goal is not to be a good Jew, a good person, but to be a great Jew, a great person. In 120 years when I leave this planet, if someone says Steve Eisenberg was a good human being and a good Jew, I'll consider my life a failure. I want to be a great Jew. I want to be a great son, a great brother. People say I'm a good person. Where we come from, we have 3,300 years. And how do we see this from Rebecca? Rebecca um, from Ripka, Abram, Oswald. Next. Um, you learn tonight that Sarah lived 127, that every year of her life, all the goodness that she did down the road, her great, 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 great granddaughter, Esther, will benefit physically from what she did. Whatever we do in this world, whatever we spray out, goodness, chesed, kindness, smiling at someone, helping someone, whatever we can do is we think it's over, it's not. Shem doesn't forget any chesed that we do. What do we learn tonight is love, ahava, the word is hav, which means to give. What does it mean you love someone? So recently someone said they love me. The person is a little challenging. What does it mean they love me? They call me a lot of anguish. Okay, just saying I love you is actions, correct? It has to be deeds. Don't tell me, you know, you love me. Show me your actions. We learned this tonight. Yeah, but it says okay. don't tell me you love me. Show by your actions. 
Thank you. Oh, oh, my cousin. Hi, Marilyn. How are you? <laughs> Hi. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And thank you so much. Please for your mention speech. my name. What's that? Hi, hi, Marilyn Lollowitz from Bell Harbor. Hi. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so with that, I want to, I want to show a toll. I want to thank Dr. Rita Steiner for dedicating the class in honor of the children, Shabana Bracha. And with that, we're going to have a, a, little, a little talk now from a, a maiden gated coach from, from Florida, New York, Jerusalem. But we're also going to make a Chaim, Stephanie and Alex, who just got engaged. Right? <laughs> So, uh, uh, Mazel Tov. What's going on? So, we're going to have an international Shabbaton. We're probably 24 hours away from putting it together. On January 7th, 7th we have uh, Chicago, Toronto, Montreal, San Francisco singles coming in to Bell Harbor. The way it's going to be is we have about 200, hopefully 200 uh, seats and families in Surfside, Bell Harbor Village. They're going to host singles. And then they're all going to come back to a big dessert reception at the 10th house. Shabbos morning, we're going to have a free kiddish lunch at the Young Israel. We're going to have a musical on 95th Street and Collins. And then Saturday night, we're going to have drinks at the uh, Grand Beach Hotel. February 17th, we're almost ready. We're going to do a uh, Shabbat in Mexico City. Price should be between 749 and 859 which is break even, plus air for it. So we're going to meet uh, people from 17 cities and seven countries. February 17th, we're going to arrive in Mexico City. We're going to go to the like, best restaurant and kosher course. In Mexico City, we're going to have tour buses in Mexico City. And then we're going to have a Shabbat dinner in the Hilton. And then we're going to tour Saturday night. So February 17th, we're doing this in conjunction with K-Space and Rizzo. And that's it. So with that, young lady, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, boy. I don't know why you do this. Are we keeping the camera or stopping it? Uh, it was, I, no, it's not important. All right, I'll do it. Mommy, it has to be back. She put the scripts you guys were saying. This is, I, I no, like all no, this in the background in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> so everybody else sees Steve in the middle of the ocean. Hi, everyone. Thanks for humoring me a few minutes. Steve, thank you so much. Steve was kind enough to let me speak because I'm a professional matchmaker. And so this Parsha really coincided with what I do. So just to give you guys a little bit of insights, I've been doing this for eight years, my full-time job. I had made Aliyah yeah. in Tel Aviv. So I started there matching international Jewish singles. So I say like, I understand every Jewish mentality because of living there. If I had not, I never would have had the idea to do this. And also, if you guys are familiar with that show, The Millionaire Matchmaker, that also gave you the idea. And I said, someone needs to be doing this in Tel Aviv for like the modern uh, Jewish olim, you know, the, the immigrants that come there, which are like young professionals, like this room, and the Israelis, and to match them. Yes, exactly. I bet Steve has met her, I'm sure. <laughs> with everybody he knows. I've met her too, and I've been in her home. So that was, that was a hoot. Um, okay, so just to share with you guys, if you want a copy of this, I'm so happy to like email it out later but I developed something that I call my eight key preferences when finding your ideal partner it's what I use to decide if I should take someone on as a client it helps me see if they're being realistic uh, so actually I, re I renamed it the matchability self-test so if you have it you can like do a self-test on yourself and then realize like oh maybe this is keeping me single because I need to open up a few search parameters so it's funny that one that's not on the list that is a given uh, so it doesn't need to be on the list is chesed like everybody comes to me saying, I want kind hearted. I want good me dote. I want a good, like no one comes and says, I want a narcissist and a selfish person, you know, <laughs> like no one. And when they write me in their deal breakers, no narcissist. I'm like, okay, was that necessary? <laughs> like, yes, I really want to set you up with a narcissist. That, that's my grand plan. So it's quite funny when people like do that, like the no narcissist thing, I crack up. Um, Unfortunately, there are some out there. Okay, so this self-test, it's gonna seem like common sense, but you never kind of just thought about it in this logical way. So the first thing is age range, the youngest to oldest you're willing to date. Um, men always tell me all the time they wanna date younger. It's my job to try to get them to go up a bit. And, and age is just on a page and it's about, and then women too that tell me like, oh, but like I'm 40, but I feel like I'm 35. So I shouldn't have to go, you know, that much older. I'm a cardiologist, but, my heart. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. So just like age is a number. It's about like 
how active you are, the vitality. So I say to try to drop it if you can. I know like if you're worried about having children, people have that fear, but there's a lot of stuff, modern technology. There's other ways to have a family, adoption. So let's just keep an open mind and not just judge the age on the page. Location, second one, are you willing to go out of state, um, out of the country? Uh, my clients that are the most open on this one, I can help them the most. Uh, the more open you are on location. And it just depends if you're closed on other ones, then we open location up. Um, uh, political views, you know, this is a hot topic today. This one I would say is more tied to your values. Same with the next one, religious level. So if you're like, I'm left or I'm right and I need someone the same, I'm not going to like tell you to necessarily open up, but I say maybe moderates are the best. I, I joke that they're type O daters, like type O blood type. They can go to either side. So try to get yourself to be a moderate. It's also with your religious views. If you're kind of like moderate where it's like, um, I like like coming to Steve's classes and like I'm growing, but like if the person's like reform, you know, maybe we can like, maybe I can rub off on them a bit. And like Steve says, it's like it, the woman kind of sets the tone for the home. Um, physical appearance preferences, very, very tricky one. Um, you know, I, I say like, can they be balding? Can they, they be shorter than you? You know, like again, we're all the same. I've heard this from another matchmaker sitting down or lying down. You know, do we really need to judge height women? Do we really need high heels? They, my dad's a podiatrist. They ruin our feet anyway. <laughs> let's dish the high heels if we can. I used to be a stand up comedian too. So, um, <laughs> let's, let's ditch the high heels. Uh, let's, let's open this up. If you want someone really in shape, you know, and like, so maybe you're dating someone that has needs to lose like 10, 20 pounds, but so maybe you can like inspire them, you know, like maybe they used to do running and they just got busy with work and you start with walking and just try to look in the soul, in the heart. Um, and it, it, if you're doing online dating, like definitely put in, like expand your inches of height and your age, because it, you could just expand by one number and all of a sudden like more options open, you know, so then might as well expand by three years of age, you know, um, cultural, ethnic background, uh, the more open you can be. My, my favorite marriages are when they are different cultural, ethnic backgrounds. I think it's so cool. I have two American men with the same last name, which is so weird. They're not related. Do you know Jewish or last names repeat? They're both, one's engaged to a Brazilian woman, one's married to a Brazilian woman. Um, I have a Danish woman and an Israeli man married and an Israeli man and a Dutch woman married. And they met in Israel and then went to go live in those countries, like in Denmark and Holland. I was like, that's not what I, I, I set you up for, but <laughs> they wanted to go back, give the kids dual citizenship. So it's really cool if you can be open on cultural ethnic background and because your kids are gonna speak many languages, it's super cool. Um, marital status, can you be with someone who was previously married, widowed, you know, if we can be open on this, it's great. And if they have previous children, if you want children, of course you want someone who wants more children, not telling you not to want that. But you know, if someone comes with like one or two kids, but you already see he can be a great father or she can be a great mother. So think of it as like, I can, I can see what they can already do, you know? So that's kind of nice. So I hope everyone just uses these on themselves, maybe makes themselves a bit more open. Talk to someone in the room tonight that like maybe you wouldn't because you never know. So I always tell everyone be each other's matchmaker because you can have a friend, you can have a business colleague, you can have a niece, a nephew. You might know someone for someone in the room. I was doing a lot of events with the JIC and the pandemic on Zoom. So we did like a round, a round table. Like I'd be like, okay, your turn, who are, you know? And so people like did after they stayed in touch they introduced each other to their friends. There were like a few relationships out of that. So sometimes no news is good news. When I don't hear back, like people were happy. <laughs> so I know there's probably much more relationships out there than those reported and come to the shop of tones. You can meet people from international backgrounds. That's why Steve's doing it, I think. So we have trilingual babies, right? And uh, all right, so thanks for having me, Steve. Thank okay. you so much. So, for the number. Okay, oh, yeah. now take your cell phones out. Oh yeah, my number. Yes. Oh, by the way, if anybody meets Monday night class, I would pay two nights at the at the Savings Hotel. Okay. That is amazing. That is quite a yeah. Take my number. Married, keep married, in touch. Okay. Um, my company's <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's true. You gotta be married. Uh, my company's called Fast Pass to Love because my last name is Fast, so I took it from famous from famous Disney. Um, my number is eight one eight. My my name is Jessica. My last name's Fast. F A S S. And the company's called Fast Pass to Love. You can Google it. You can text me. I'll send you the website. Oh, Tara, my top recruiter, profile writer, assistant matchmaker is here too. So thank you, Tara, for everything you do. Um, okay, so it's 818. I'm from LA. 419-99-9999.
818-419-9977. Really easy. 818-419-9977. Tell me we met at Steve's also. So I'll prioritize her. And I'll, show, I'll tell you where you can make a free profile in my database so I can keep you in mind for clients. If you're interested in becoming a client, we'll talk about that at that time. Okay, so thank also, you. Uh, thank, thank you, thank, thank you, thank you. Also, Flying and Zushi are making amazing events. So find Zushi, a flying, give them your cell phone number. Okay, so with that, thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thank you. Okay, one second. Guys, Alex. Alex? Alex? Yeah, please.